In this segment, we're going to co uh, consider the pre-CT general considerations, indications and limitations for the spine. So what do we need to consider first of all? Like with every other body area, we need to consider the general advantages and disadvantages of using CT. The advantages are many, but they have to be weighed up against the disadvantages to make sure we're, um, we're making the right decision to pursue CT. So it may be that you ask yourself a few questions prior to, to making that choice. Is CT appropriate for the anatomy I want to image? In this case, um, the spine. Will it hopefully answer the clinical question? Is it cost effective for the patient? Are there any contraindications to using CT? Or very importantly with the spine, are there any other more appropriate imaging modalities I should consider first? In that case, it may be MRI. Which body areas or anatomic regions should I scan with CT? So in the case of the spine, it's which spinal cord segments do I need to include? And what type of acquisition do I need to perform? Specifically, should I do a myelogram as well? So when do we choose CT for the spine? Well, sometimes if a lesion is primarily related to the spinal cord, so a myelopathy, then MRI is preferable and recommended. But that is only where practical and available. And there's plenty of other reasons why you might choose to do, say, spinal radiographs or spinal CT first. And that's understandable. Indica indications for spinal imaging include trauma, spinal pain, the presence of tetral paraparesis or even plegia, where MRI may not be available. Any hind limb lameness that's not attributable, attributable to orthopedic disease, again, where MRI is not available. And then any characterization and confirmation of vertebral lesions seen on radiographs. And it's important to remember the limitations. There's many etiologies causing acute and chronic myelopathies that may not be seen um, on CT. And therefore, if you can't see them, and you can't make a specific diagnosis, then it means that you can't make an appropriate management plan for that patient. So what information do we need and what options do we have prior to choosing CT? Well, like with all other body areas, a thorough physical exam examination is essential. And it may be that you identify swellings, masses that may be safe to, to sample prior to any further imaging. A thorough neurological exam is gonna be abs absolutely essential in these cases, and it needs to be conscious if feasible, because then you get a true representation of any neurological deficits in that patient. Any, any um, sedation is going to affect the results of that test. And we really would recommend a consultation with a neurologist prior to performing any imaging, because they can help you make the right, de right decision of which imaging to use. So the other first line imaging we have available to us is MRI, and then also spinal radiographs. And really, if you do have any um, clinical signs that are of a myelopathy, then MRI could be considered as the first line imaging modality. But that, that might require referral to an institution that has MRI prior to this. So have a, let's have a look at this patient who's got um, uh, an acute paraparesis. In this case, we have the initial sagittal reconstruction and transverse reconstruction in soft tissue window um, of the spine, of the thoracolumbar spine. And as we play this through, we're going from cranial to caudal, and we reach these locations where there's evidence of herniation of intervertebral disc material because there's hyperattenuating material with a few mineralized foci that are above the intervertebral disc space and are occupying a, a, a proportion of the cross-sectional area of the vertebral canal. And here we can see it's present at this disc space, but also we have some present at this disc space as here. So that's L2, L3 and L3, L4 and then a very small amount, L4, L5 there, okay? But what we don't get an appreciation for is which might be the acutely herniated disc in this situation, because the degenerate disc, a degenerate disc may have a degree of mineralization within. When we perform the myelogram, we're putting contrast into the subarachnoid space and delineating the spinal cord better. And with the addition of this, you can see that as we reach that first L2, L3 disc, there's both interruption of the dorsal and ventral contrast column in the subarachnoid space. And you can see that the, the spinal cord is pushed over to the left-hand side here, and that we have this irregular contrast margination with material within the vertebral canal on the right-hand side. And then as we come further back, we can see when we reach this other disc herniation, yes, the, the, the material interrupts the ventral contrast column, but the, otherwise the contrast column is circumferentially intact around the spinal cord. So this is indicating that this one is probably a more chronic intervertebral disc, whereas this one is probably the acute disc extrusion here at this location. 
So what are the limitations of spinal CT? Well, when we're trying to assess the spinal cord, the soft tissue contrast resolution is limited. So diagnosis of the intramedullary or intradural extramedullary lesions is limited. And the soft tissue structures within the vertebral canal are very small as well. So assessment of these structures can be easily limited by artifacts, um, but also in, in combination with that limited contrast resolution. So you can see here in these, in these images here, the CT of this spine of a pug here, it's very difficult to differentiate where there's, the, there's intervertebral disc material from the spinal cord itself. But when we have the MRI image, we get much better soft tissue contrast resolution and are able to, um, to differentiate the discs, discs from the spinal cord and any interruption of the subarachnoid space filled with CSF much, much better. Hence why MRI is preferable and recommended in a lot of, a lot of cases where there's a myelopathy. So what are the general acquisition considerations that we need to make sure that our CT is success for the spine? Well, we want to position the spine as straight as possible. OK, we have to take care with trauma patients because we don't want to, to, to cause extra damage to the spinal cord in an already unst unstable vertebral canal, um, vertebral, vertebral um, column in the case of fractures or luxation. So we can consider a spinal board in these cases. And sometimes you may want to do the, the CT acquisition in lateral recumbency. So the patient remains immobilized throughout the scan. Otherwise, dorsal recumbency is preferable. You can do sternal in some situations, but then you have to carefully consider that we need apnea to avoid any motion artifact as well. So dorsal recumbency is preferable to stabilize the spine for CT. Again, we need, similar with musculoskeletal CT, we need to consider the display field of view. So reducing that reconstructed in-plane field of view around the vertebrae is gonna increase the spatial resolution. If you want any further detailed advice on um, CT protocols for the spine, then do have a look at the other VET CT protocols that we have. Finally, what are the common CT body error combinations that may arise? Well, first of all, I think it's worth noting that segments of the spine are included in other, other body regions. So if you're doing a, an otherwise a neck scan, then you're going to get all of the, the, the cervical spine. If you're doing thoracic and abdominal ex examinations, then you're going to get the thoracolumbar spine. But often in combination, we would look to do head and spine together in some situations. It may be that the cervical spine is included with the shoulders in cases of lameness or shoulder or caudal cervical pain. And then otherwise for hind limb lameness, you may do it in conjunction with pelvis and hips and then spine, pelvis and the rest of the hind limbs maybe potentially as well. So thank you very much for listening. If you, have, if you want any further information on spinal CT, then please don't hesitate to contact us. Thank you.